On January 1, 2012, I decided to launch a personal project. I was determined to cook at least one recipe every day for the entire year from one particular historic cookbook. Throughout 2012, my community, Kitchener, was going to be celebrating 100 years of cityhood. I decided that cooking daily from a local cookbook from the same era would be a good way to recognize this special event. The 1906 Berlin cookbook can be found in museums and archives in Kitchener, Waterloo, but is not well known beyond. My project was a way to make this local community cookbook better known. I decided that one way to share my findings and keep me committed to this project was to write a daily blog. I knew little about blogs at the time, so I asked my friends on Facebook which host site they recommended. WordPress was the most common response. So on January 1st, I set up a blog called 366 Days with the Berlin Cookbook. Why 366 days? I suddenly realized that it was a leap year. <laughs> and this project was going to take one more day than I expected. I was determined to do more than post a recipe. I wanted to create the atmosphere of the early 20th century, so I provided information about the period, about the period's cooking and ingredients. I also wanted to find out about the person contributing the recipe, a tall order while cooking and writing every evening in my kitchen. I expected readers to be a few friends and people interested in culinary history, so I wrote for this imaginary audience, but it grew. There were culinary historians, museum workers, genealogists, and people who just loved to cook or who loved history. People were interested in the stories of the women contributing recipes. I didn't expect my readership to grow and include people from all over North America and a few in other countries. I soon had to alter the way I wrote so that I explained things for non-cooks and people living outside the area. My only promotion was a daily post on Facebook, which I, was shared by others. Kitchener was a tag in my blog, and so the city linked their website. An article in the local paper expanded readership. Search engines picked it up. People might be popping in for one post, so I had to treat each post as a separate entity and not assume that the reader knew about the cookbook. I didn't think about this blog as a form of interpretation until near year's end, and yet it was interpretive, at least based on Interpretation Canada's definition. It was a communication process designed to reveal meanings and relationships of cultural heritage to the public. This blog was a way to present this forgotten and fragile cookbook and the recipes and people hidden inside, to share information about historic cooking, at least the historic cooking methods, and most of all, to show that this cookbook and its contents are still relevant today. Just as with any interpretation, some readers interacted regularly, posting comments and questions, but there were also the silent ones, the ones we don't know we are reaching, with our exhibits, tours, and events. I'm still discovering people who followed my blog but never let me know. Readers commented in person, on the blog, and on Facebook. As with any good interpretation, this interaction with readers influenced my writing. I began to describe in more detail and not assume anything. I conversed with my readers through comments and in blog content. I was blogging for myself, but blogs are for museums too. Create one to chart the development and growth in your heritage garden. Why not write during the hottest part of the day? Some material can be written ahead and then posted when appropriate. Have a summer student or volunteer transcribe a diary in your collection. Post the entries in real time to give the sense of time passing for readers. Add information to match current events or provide background. Encourage readers to comment. During the construction, of a new building, the curator of the Waterloo Region Museum wrote a weekly column about artifacts. Why not expand on this idea? Create a blog to bring your collection out of storage. Prepare entries ahead and they'll post automatically. Make it personal. Have people, have different people choose a favorite object and write about it. People want to know what goes on in a museum. Take them behind the scenes via a blog about what's currently going on in exhibit design or conservation or program planning, 
or what you do when the site is closed to the public. This extra information via blog is not taking up space on your website and is interactive. Unlike Facebook, a blog is available to anyone accessing the internet, but do link it to your other modes of communication. A blog is text heavy, so it isn't for every visitor, but you might reach a different audience. Check regularly and respond to readers. It is time consuming, but guest bloggers or virtual volunteers can take the load off if you have a final approval. A blog is free, except for time. Choose a blog host and a template to match your museum and content. Play with it before going live, but don't be afraid to jump into the world of blogs. I did it for a year. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.